let's go imagining together to a place so old it's always new we'll tell it to my friends to you and share a smile before we're through and share a smile before we're through Ray and I have two stories for you today, and they both have to do with the same thing. Now, see if you can figure it out. You're going to get just what's coming, do you? Oh, you're going to get what you deserve. You figure it out? Well, both stories have to do with people and animals who did something wrong and got exactly what they deserved. And what happens to them is pretty funny. The first story is about a chicken. Well, it's sort of like a chicken. It's a, sort of a half chick. Once upon a time, there was an old hen who lived in Spain. She had a large family of baby chicks. They were plump and fluffy and followed her around wherever she went. Then one day, the last of her eggs hatched, and she had one more chick to add to her big family. Only this chick was not at all like the others. He was only half a chick, as though he had been made out of a board. He only had one leg, one wing, and one eye. Mother Hen took one look at this new chick and shook her head. I shall have to call you Medio Polito, half chick. While all the other chicks stayed close to the Mother Hen and always did as they were told, half chick liked to hop off on his own. With only one leg, half chick moved about in a most unusual way. He would hop and then kick hop and kick. His mother would have to call him often when he wandered off by himself. Why don't you behave like your brothers and sisters? Stay close by me where I can keep an eye on you, Medio Polito. Because this world is new to me and I am new to this world and there's lots to see and do. Well, all in due time, said mother. But you must learn many things before you go out on your own. But nothing his mother said would convince Half Chick. He was willful and stubborn. And as he grew a little, he became a little more willful and stubborn. One day when he was seven weeks old, Half Chick hop kicked up to his mother, cocked his head, and looked at her with his one eye. It's boring here. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to look at but corn. I was born for better things, more exciting things. I think I'll go to Madrid to see the king. In Madrid, I shall have a fine palace, and you can come there and visit me. Oh, no, 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 you're too young. Wait until you're grown. Then we can go together to Madrid. I cannot wait. I cannot stay another day in this dull, boring place. Well, if you must go, I promise you will be polite and kind to those you meet. Remember, the world is a big place, and you are very small. You'll need the kindness of others to survive. Well, off hopped Half Chick without ever listening to his mother. He was so eager to see the world, he did not care about kindness and politeness. Those were for others. Well, late that afternoon, as Half Chick crossed a field on his way to Madrid, he came to a stream. The stream was gurgling with a choking sound because weeds and plants were growing in a great tangle and the water could not flow freely. Oh, please, Medio Polito, cried the water in the stream. Please clear away all these weeds so that I can flow. What do you mean? I don't got time to waste here with you. You shouldn't bother busy travelers such as I. Can't you see I'm on my way to visit that king? Clear the weeds yourself. And off he hopped. Later on, Half Chick came to a fire that some people had left by the roadside. It was burning very low and about to go out. Oh, please, Medio Polito, you can see that soon I shall burn out. Please bring me some twigs and dry leaves or else I shall die. Who cares? There shall be plenty of fires in Madrid. Why should I waste my time bringing you twigs and leaves? I'm off to see the king. Get your leaves and twigs yourself. And off he hop kicked. Well, farther down the road, Half Chick came upon a large tree. 
up in the branches, the wind had been trapped, and it was moaning painfully. <gasps> oh, please, Medio Polito. I am caught in the branches of this tree. Please climb up. Release me, or I shall never be free. Well, you shouldn't have gone up there in the first place. I'm not so stupid as to help a silly wind caught in a tree. I'm off to Madrid to see the king. I don't like wind anyway. So off he hopped kicked to Madrid. When Half Chick came close to the big city of Madrid, he was excited by all the large houses. The largest house had soldiers standing by the gate, and Half Chick knew it must be the palace of the king. He hopped kicked straight for the palace. As he passed the kitchen window, the cook spotted Half Chick and said, the king has ordered chicken for dinner, and here's the very thing. The cook reached out of the window and grabbed Half Chick. Without wasting a moment, the cook threw Half Chick into a pot and poured water all over him. The water made Half Chick's feathers stick to one side. Oh, please, water, don't wet me so it feels so cold and uncomfortable. You would not help me when I was choking in the stream. So why should I have pity on you now? You are getting just what you deserve. Then the cook hung the pot over the fire and put the lid on. It became hot inside the pot, and Half Chick cried, Oh, fire! Don't burn so hot! Hey, have pity! Don't you know it hurts? Aha, Medio Polito. Don't you remember when I was dying by the road and you would not help me? You are getting just what you deserve. Later, the cook lifted the lid off the pot, and Half Chick gave a mighty hop out of the pot, out of the window, into the open air. And there he was caught and taken up by the wind. The wind hurled him and twirled him until he could hardly breathe. Ah, ah, oh, wind, wind, don't be so rough, please. Put me down, please. Have pity, put me down. You had no pity for me when I was caught in the tree. Why should I spare you now? You're getting just what you deserve. And with that, the wind took Half Chick to the top of the tallest tower in the town, and there he fastened him for good. And there he stands today on his one foot, his one wing drooping, and his one sad eye gazing down on all of Madrid. If you went to Madrid today, you'd probably see Half Chick standing up on his tower. Our second story is called The Squire's Bride. There was once a rich squire who owned lots of land and had lots of money. There was only one thing he didn't have, a wife. The squire's neighbor, Bjorn, a poor man, had a beautiful daughter, Bridget, who worked in the hayfields. As she grew older, she grew more beautiful. And one day, the squire noticed her working in the hay. He said to himself, Bjorn's daughter is quite a lovely lady. I shall take her for my wife. He went over to where she was raking the hay and spoke to her. Uh, Bridget, now that you're old enough to marry, I have decided to make you my wife. Now, Bridget had never liked the squire. But she had always been polite, for her father owed the squire a lot of money. Thank you for the offer, squire, but I think not, not today. Now, the squire was not used to being refused. He marched off to have a little talk with Bridget's father, Bjorn. Now, look here, Bjorn. For years, I have loaned you money to keep your farm going. I'm willing to forget your debt if you will tell Bridget to marry me. Bjorn thought about this. He did owe quite a lot to the squire, more than he could ever repay. It would be wonderful to be out of debt. The squire added, And not only will I forget what you owe me, I will give you 100 more acres to add to your farm, and when I die, Bridget will get all that I have. Bjorn found this a most pleasant offer, and promised to talk with his daughter that very evening. Oh, listen, Bridget, if you will only marry the squire, we will be set for the rest of our days. No debts, no worries. I don't care if he showers us with gold up to our ears. I'm not marrying the squire, Father. I can't stand him. Now, let's just talk about something else. 
so try as he might, Bjorn could not convince Bridget to marry the squire. The next day, the squire visited Bjorn again. I trust you talk some sense into your daughter. Well, not exactly. She has a mind of her own, and she's not ready to marry. But I will keep working on her. I'm sure when the time is right, she'll see things our way. Fine, I don't want to waste time. I want to marry right away, and I want to marry Bridget. Now you either get her to agree, or I'll call in your debt tomorrow, and you'll owe me 2000 If you can't pay, I'll take your farm and all your livestock. Poor Bjorn. He almost wept at the thought of losing everything he had worked so hard to gain. He could do nothing against the squire. He finally took pencil and paper. Here, squire, I shall sign a contract with you, giving you Bridget. How you get her to come to your house will be your problem, but by this contract, she will be rightfully yours. So Bjorn signed the paper, giving his daughter to the squire. The squire smiled and grunted. Oh, don't worry about that. That which is rightfully mine, I have always taken. I shall have no problem. For the next five days, the squire's servant set about making his house ready for the big wedding. He invited people from miles around. It was to be the wedding of the century. When all was ready, the squire called for his young valet. Now go straight to Bjorn's house and say, the squire has sent for that which is rightfully his. Bring her back here and bring her in the back and take her up the back stairs to her bedroom and see that the maids dress her in her gown and veil and then bring her down the front hall stairs into the ballroom where I'll be waiting with the preacher. Oh, yes, sir. The valet ran off to Bjorn's farm, and when he found Bjorn, he announced, Um, I have come for that which the squire says is rightfully his. Oh, she's out in the field working in the hay. Off ran the valet into the hayfield where he found Bridget leaning on her rake. I have come for that which the squire says is rightfully his. Oh, good, said Bridget. I've been waiting for you. I guess the squire means the gray mare yonder. Father must have sold her to the good squire. Since the valet knew no better, he accepted Bridget's instructions without question and led the old gray mare away, trying to remember the rest of his instructions. Oh, take her to the back stairs and up to the room. I'll take her to the back stairs and up to the room. When the valet reached the squire's house, he called the servants to help him. The squire says I'm to take her up the back stairs and to her room. The servants looked puzzled, but didn't question the squire's words. Together, they managed to push the old mare up the stairs and into the bedroom. The upstairs maids were a bit shocked to receive a horse, but the valet reminded them, the squire says to deck her in a gown and veil and bring her down to the ballroom. With much pushing and shoving, the maids finally got the gown and veil on the horse. The valet ran to tell his squire that the mare was ready. Oh, she is ready, sir. But are you sure you're doing the right? Don't question my word, boy. Just do as you're told. Now go now and fetch that which is rightfully mine and bring her down here for everyone to see. My lovely bride, bring her down. The valet ran upstairs and fetched the mare. There was a terrible clattering on the stairs, and when the valet threw open the ballroom doors, everyone burst out laughing. The squire felt such a fool that he never bothered Bridget again. Mm -hmm.